This morning's reading is from Matthew 12, starting at verse 22 and going through to 50. (coughs) Then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished and said, Could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if it is by the spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Make a tree good and its fruit will be good, or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognised by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth of for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you, that everyone will have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered them, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. When an impure spirit comes out of a person. It goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. And then it says, I'll return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and they live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. And someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. 
And he replied to him, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of the, my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, Naomi. Uh, Great to have God's Word read so well for us. Uh, It's a long passage, and obviously we can't go into all the details through it today. Uh, We are going to take an overview of the passage that looks at these four different reactions to Jesus, four different reactions to Jesus. Uh, I I believe we had some printing problems, is that right? So we don't actually, you don't have a sermon outline in front of you, but if you are the note-taking type, I have four points. I'm going to look at the King's admirers, then we're going to look at the King's accusers, then we'll look at the king's sceptics, and lastly, the king's family, the king's admirers, the king's accusers, the king's sceptics, and then the king's family. Uh, we'll see that as we go through. We need God's help, though. I'm gonna, we've already prayed. I'm going to pray again <laughs> as we look at this passage. Uh, join me, please. Oh, our God, um, please give us grace now to hear your word well. Give us humility before it. Help us to receive and to rest in the harder things that Jesus says, as well as the tender things, uh, because we know that every word that comes from his mouth is good and true and righteous and holy. Uh, So give us grace today, we pray. Give us repentant and trusting hearts and help us to respond rightly to Jesus. And we pray that for your glory in his name. Amen. Well, it really matters that you get someone's identity right, doesn't it? Really matters. Uh, there's a picture up on the screen. Um, knowing who someone means uh, means you can who someone is means you can relate to them in the right way. Um, th- uh, there's something we all learn from a young age. Many of us, I reckon, have probably had this experience. I, it's one of my earliest memories. Anyone else have this experience of going up to someone in the shops and hugging their legs, and it's completely the wrong person. You think it's your mum. Uh, it's one of my earliest memories. And, uh, you know, when you get someone's identity wrong, it sort of sticks with you and it it makes a difference to how you relate to them. The other one is um, calling your teacher dad. I did that once and I've never forgotten it. Um, (laughs) But you you need to know who someone is to relate to them properly, right? Uh, It's the same, it's exactly the same with Jesus. It matters that we get his identity right. Uh, Otherwise, we won't be able to relate properly to him. Uh, If you've been with us, uh, you'll know this, but Matthew, um, one of Jesus' apostles, he's been weaving this beautiful, incredible picture of Jesus up to this point in his gospel. Uh, Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's the one promised through the prophets. He's the one who was worshipped by the Magi. He prepared the way for by John the Baptist. He's the one whose word, remember the Sermon on the Mount, whose word is a rock, a sure foundation to build your life on. Uh, He's the one who has matchless authority over sickness and death and nature and even demons and the one who can forgive sins. He's the centre of all history, the one who alone reveals the Father, who invites everyone to come to him and to replace their burdens with his rest. So there's an overview, fellows who are just joining us this week. (laughs) That's, That's Matthew's Gospel up to this point. But it's a stunning picture and I think we're meant to see that as those who read Matthew's Gospel, and we're meant to think, how could anyone not love him? How could anyone not want to be with him? How could anyone not want to come to him and take up his easy and light yoke and live in thankful obedience to him? It's a shocking reality that this one, this one could come to earth and have his identity mistaken by so many. Uh, One author puts it like this. "Why Why do so many people reject the most wonderful person who has ever walked this earth? Isn't that, he, it's true, isn't it? If you've been reading Matthew's Gospel, he is the most wonderful person who has ever walked this earth. So as I mentioned at the start, what we see in this section is, is a long section, 
uh, what we see in it is these four snapshots, a series of snapshots, scenes of how different people respond to Jesus. Uh, none of them get, get him completely right. Some are kind of closer than others. Some are kind of r- well on the way. Uh, others are uh, confused. Uh, others knowingly and willfully reject him. Uh, and each of these scenes, I think, presses home to us, presses home to you the, the question, how will you respond to Jesus? How, how will you respond to who he is? So, uh, the story picks up from where we left off last week. If you remember, if you're, if you're with us, uh, Jesus is with this large crowd. He's, he's sort of um, left where he was. He's gone to this, um, uh, this other place, large crowd gathered, and we read, he healed all who were sick. Um, and Matthew saw in this, if you remember, he saw in this the fulfillment of Isaiah's servant from last week. But in verse 22, okay, it'll come up on the screen, verse 22 zeroes in on one of those who are brought to Jesus. This guy who is demon possessed, possessed by an evil spirit. Uh, some t- someone who's been held captive by dark spiritual forces that have left him blind and unable to talk. It's someone in a, an incredibly distressing and Um, sorry states and he is one of the many that were brought to jesus and are healed by him it's interesting isn't matthew doesn't actually go into the details of what's going he does in other places he doesn't go into the details he doesn't focus on this guy or even on the miracle itself just kind of says it in passing almost what he's really interested in is people's reactions to it people's reactions to it Uh, Jesus liberates this man from his oppression. He restores his sight. He loosens his tongue. And you see the first reaction in verse 23. Uh, Verse 23, the crowd is astonished. And they ask this really good question. Could this be? Could this be the son of David? These guys are on the right track. It's a pretty good response, don't you think? Uh, it's, It's not a full response, but it's on the right... They... Because that is exactly the right question to ask, because that is exactly who Jesus actually is. Matthew has been showing this all the way through. The very first verse of Matthew's Gospel, if you feel like flicking to it, you can see the very first verse says, uh, des- describes Jesus as the Son of David. It's a huge claim for anyone who knows the Jewish Scriptures, our Old Testament, Uh, David was Israel's greatest king, and and God had made these massive promises to him. Back in 2 Samuel 7, you can read about it. Uh, One one of his descendants would reign forever over God's kingdom. Uh, Not just for 30 or 40 years, like a a long sort of reign of a king might be, but reign forever. Uh, There would come a Messiah who would be God's eternal king. And the crowd watching this miracle are kind of joining the dots, right? They're, they're seeing all that Jesus is doing and all that he's saying, and their, their minds are sort of getting blown by this possibility. Could this be the one we've been waiting for, the son of David, the true king of God's kingdom? So that's the first reaction. But of course, most of the passage that we read, most of it responds, focuses on people who... Uh, uh, don't have that reaction to Jesus. They are people who are actually intent on misunderstanding Jesus' identity. Uh, We've already seen the Pharisees ramp up in their opposition to Jesus along the way. Uh, They've already decided, and if you remember last week, uh, they're, they're plotting to kill him at this point. So what they do is they use this miraculous healing... They follow Jesus to this point. They, they use this healing as an opportunity to slander him. They make this accusation. They're kind of looking on in verse 24. It's only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Uh, in other words, you, see, you get what they're saying, right? Now, Jesus can free this poor man from his evil spirits, but, his spirit because, because Jesus himself is evil. Uh, he's a tool of Beelzebul, another, another word for Satan, the prince of demons. It's really interesting, isn't it? That they don't deny that Jesus performed an amazing miracle. They don't deny Jesus's, uh, that Jesus, this actually really happened, like it was right in front of them. They can't deny the fact of it. Uh, they don't deny something supernatural has happened. The evidence is right there in front of them, but they can't bring themselves to admit that Jesus is who he actually claims to be, 
So they start making these accusations that, if you think about it, don't actually make any sense. Right? They don't, they're, they're, it's like they're, they're clutching at straws, refusing to follow where the evidence actually leads. They've already decided in their hearts that they hate Jesus and all that he stands for. And, and, and Jesus points this out as you, as you go on. It's absurd, he says, it's absurd that Satan would be driving out Satan. Satan's evil, but he's not stupid. Basically, that's what Jesus is saying. It's, a, it's an absurdity to, to say that. Satan isn't driving out, uh, Jesus isn't driving out this darkness by Beelzebul. Uh, jump down to verse 28. Jesus says uh, he's driving this out by the, whole, the Spirit of God. It's by the Spirit of God, not by the Prince of Demons <laughs> that Jesus is doing this. And if that's happening, well then, if, that, if that's happening, if it's by the Spirit of God, Jesus says, well then, the crowds are on the right track. The Son of David is here. And what does he say? The kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God has come upon you. What's really going on here? It's not some kind of senseless, self-destructive work of the devil. It's actually something much bigger and much more exciting. Uh, in the big story of the Bible, the, the world is, has, has been in the grip of Satan ever since our first parents turned from God and believed Satan's lies. And what Jesus is doing here is nothing less than overturning that and destroying the work of the devil, saving people from his grip. He uses that, that really fascinating image, right, as you, you would have picked it up as we read through, of, uh, of this strong man in, uh, in a house and someone sort of breaking in to tie him up and plunder his house. Uh, the, the point is, Satan's the strong man. Uh, Satan's the strong man and Jesus is saying, he is stronger than the strong man. So, uh, so Satan has kind of dominion over that house, but Jesus is saying he's tying up the strong man so Jesus can, can plunder Satan's house. You see what he's saying? He's the son of David, bringing in God's eternal kingdom, and he's in the business of plundering Satan's house. In other words, of freeing people from his grip, of destroying his work. And to get wrong who he is, not just kind of accidentally misun misunderstanding him or not having enough kind of um, uh, enough evidence before you or, or not the, encountering him enough, but to willfully misunderstand him like the Pharisees, to, to willfully reject him and all he's doing, to have Jesus right in front of you and to harden your heart to him. Jesus goes on to say that puts you in an incredibly dangerous position, incredibly dangerous. That's, that's what's behind those strong words Jesus goes on to say from verse 30. He says, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. Strong words, but it is a passage that has unfortunately caused Christians, I think, unnecessary angst. Uh, people who may think that they've kind of accidentally or unwittingly committed this sin that's locked them out from God's kingdom. Um, we've actually looked at this when we went through Mark's gospel, so I think I spoke a bit more fully on it back then. If you really want to follow it up, chase that down. But basically, if you're worried you might have committed this sin, it's a sure sign that you haven't. Um, Jesus is talking here about willful, knowing rejection of God's work by His Spirit in your life. To cut yourself off from Christ and all that He gives. Uh, and on one level, it just makes sense, doesn't it? To blaspheme the Spirit in that way, to willfully, knowingly reject the work of God's Spirit in your life, and who Christ is, uh, to, to, to do that means that you won't have access to Christ's forgiveness. Of course it means. It's only in Christ, by the Spirit, that there is any forgiveness at all. So to reject Him is to remain unforgiven. But 
uh, <laughs> please talk to me afterwards if that's something, uh, uh, an issue for you that you want to keep talking about. But don't miss the wonderful news here. It's easy to kind of skip over the really wonderful news. Did you see that in verse 31? Every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven. That's the wonderful news that, that is here. Every kind of... And I think he's saying even to these Pharisees, if they would just come to him in repentance and faith, every kind of sin can be forgiven. But you keep reading and you don't get much of a sense that that's actually going to happen. Uh, because there's something more going on for these guys. There's something deeper in their hearts, a, a rottenness and a darkness. And, and this, this accusation of, of Jesus that he's demonic, it's actually just the overflow of what's already in their hearts. Uh, so the next section uh, from verse 33, it talks about Jesus being, uh, uh, um, Jesus talks about a tree being recognised by its fruit. We saw that. Um, uh, their, their words, the, the words of the Pharisees accusing Jesus of being demonic reveal what's really going on in their heart. That's, what, that's the kind of the point Jesus is making. Uh, and he says, he, he makes this uh, amazing sort of cutting claim in verse 34. He, he, they're actually the brood of vipers, of snakes. Um, maybe there's hints there of the early chapters of Genesis. You know, they're the ones who are actually connected with Satan and his work, who are bringing evil things out of the evil stored up in them. And their words will testify against them on the day of judgment. That whole section there is worth kind of reflecting on again. It's a helpful reminder to us of how important our words are, isn't it? How, how they do actually reveal our hearts. Um, and it's important not to just go off one-offs, but off of trajectories. Are, are you growing more patient and gracious in your speech? That's a good indicator of what's going on in your heart. Uh, but uh, does your love of juicy gossip <laughs> kind of reveal something about uh, something going on deep in your own heart? Does, uh, does that angry outburst uh, does it not actually come, you know how we say, oh, I don't, don't know where that came from? <laughs> well, Jesus would say, well, it came from, it didn't come from nowhere, it came from in here. Um, how those, those critical words, what do they reveal about what's going on inside of you? So we need to ask God to forgive us and help us for how we use our words. And he will, he will. Every kind of sin can be forgiven and will if we ask. Okay, but so we've, we've, where are we up to? We've looked at these two different responses. The king's admirers, then the, the king's accusers. That doesn't work too well for them. So they change tack from here on in, from verse 38. The Pharisees change tack. They move from accusing Jesus to kind of scepticism. They say to Jesus in verse 38, okay, you want us to believe you? Well, show us some kind of sign. Show us a sign. And on one level, that's an understandable thing. Uh, it seems to me, I've had lots of friends, and I've had this experience too, who have, in recent years, had these increasing phone calls from unknown numbers, uh, claiming that they're from my bank. Anyone else have this? <laughs> and asking to confirm all my details. Uh, if you get that kind of call, it's a really good idea to, be, to check their identity, right? <laughs> to, to make sure it really is them. It's probably not. Um, but so on one level, it's understandable. They want to sort of make sure that Jesus is who he's saying he is. But as you read on, you see that this isn't actually a genuine question from people who are open to the truth. Uh, it's just the kind of hard-nosed skeptics question who has already rejected Jesus in their heart. Um, and what's more, Jesus has shown, shown, Jesus has shown more than enough evidence that he is who he says he is. So in verse 39, he, he says he's not going to give a sign to them. He, he's not some kind of performing monkey, you know, like to do signs on demand. But there is going to be a sign he does point them to. There is going to be a sign. The great sign of who he is, this, this sign of Jonah. Uh, uh, you probably know the story of Jonah in the Old Testament. It's this story of, uh, it's, it's, there's lots in it, but it's, it's this story of miraculous kind of, it's a picture of death and resurrection, of Jonah being buried for three days in the belly of a huge fish and 
and raised again by God's power in order to bring God's word to the people of Nineveh. Uh, they hear it, they repent, and they, and the, they also receive a kind of new life. The, the big idea Jesus seems to be getting at in this, this part is Jesus is the greater Jonah who, who he is going to die and rise again to give the ultimate new life. And if the people of Nineveh listen to Jonah, how much more should you listen to Jesus? That's sort of basically his big point here. But these accusing, sceptical Pharisees, they've, they've already rejected Jesus in their hearts. They don't listen to him. And Jesus says that they're going to be called to account uh, he, in verse 41, he points to these people of Nineveh and he says, they are going to rise up in the judgment and condemn this generation. Uh, the people who had God's eternal king in their midst but still didn't repent, unlike the people of Nineveh. Uh, there's another example from the Old Testament in uh, the Queen of the South that he, Jesus talks about, a similar kind of idea. She came from the ends of the earth to hear Solomon um, and she will condemn these people who refuse to listen to wisdom incarnate, to Christ himself, the word made flesh. Uh, there's so much in here. Jesus goes back to the original issue of unclean spirits then with this illustration of a house, uh, a metaphor for a person. Uh, he gets rid of one unclean spirit and then lots come in at the end and make it worse than the, the they, they're like the world's worst tenants. Okay, they, they come in and trash the joint. There's, there's heaps in there. Uh, but we're not going to get into it all. But it fits Jesus' big idea that these Pharisees, these Pharisees are actually in a worse state having seen Jesus and rejected him. They're in a worse state than before, a worse state than the people of Nineveh, a worse state than the Queen of the South. And this is a sobering thing that Jesus is saying to us. It's a firm warning here for the person who knows all about Jesus but still refuses to come to him in repentance and faith, who doesn't follow him. It's, it's a really harsh, or hard, not harsh, it's a loving but hard and certain warning for that long-term churchgoer who is not trusting in Jesus as your king and saviour, if that's you, you are in a dangerous position because the people of Nineveh will condemn these Pharisees on the day of judgment and you have much more than even the Pharisees did. Think about that, where they were in the story of Jesus. You actually, they, the Pharisees had way more than the people of Nineveh. You have more than the Pharisees did. You have this sign of Jonah fulfilled. You have the reality of the risen Christ proclaimed to you and God is calling you here through his word to make sure you're not like these Pharisees. You might have genuine questions about Jesus and if so, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. Come to our Hope Explored course next term, get in touch with me or another leader here and would love to help you think through those questions. But it might be that you're refusing to trust Jesus. It might also be, not just because you haven't um, heard enough or seen enough, it might just be because of the hardness of your own hearts. And no amount of talking, no signs, no debate will convince you. Friends, if that's you, I want to urge you to ask God for a new heart, <laughs> because that's what you need. That's what you need, so you can see Jesus for who he really is and you can relate to him rightly, so you won't be condemned on the day of judgment along with these Pharisees, but will be welcomed into the new creation as God's loved child through Christ. Well, how are we going? There's, it's a, it is a long passage. Hopefully we haven't bitten off more than we can chew, but there's one more response to Jesus I just want to quickly look at. And it's the last little paragraph that we read. One other, he, then, one other group that don't quite get Jesus right here from verse 46, his family come to him. But you notice what Matthew says there? Uh, they stay outside. His family are out on, they're on the outside I think it's a hint that they aren't coming to Jesus to, to 
take his yoke upon them and learn from him, um, they're coming to kind of pull him in line, and you see that in the other Gospels too. They're coming to kind of, yeah, pull him into line. <laughs> Uh, and Jesus makes this other shocking claim in verse 49. He points to his disciples who are with him. He says, Here are my brother and mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Seems to me that this whole chapter is like a bit of a course correction for us. We're kind of, we're, we're going down the road with Jesus, in, uh, we're driving down the road and he's saying, no, 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 don't go that way, no, 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 no. or don't go down that track, uh, let, let's keep coming back, let's keep finding the right way to, to go. You, you're not going to relate rightly to Jesus if you accuse him of being evil. Um, some people do that, and uh, it seems increasingly so actually in our society, but that's fails to see him for who he really is. That's the opposite of what's going on. You're not going to relate rightly to Jesus as a kind of perpetual sceptic, always wanting more proof and never willing to trust him. Uh, it's not enough to relate to Jesus like the crowds, simply impressed, uh, maybe amazed by him, but going no further. I mean, it's better than the other options, but it, it's not, it's, that's not enough, is it? if Jesus really is who he says he is. And this last paragraph, it's not even enough, it's not even enough to have the closest human relationship possible to Jesus, to be one of his close, intimate family members. That's not even enough to relate rightly to him. What is the way, the only way, to relate rightly to him? Well, he's already told us to come to him come to him not with our pride not not with our hands holding out how impressive we are but come to him with all our burdens in all our weariness to come to him as the only one who can restore us to the father to come to him and receive his rest to come to him and to put on his yoke to learn from him because he is gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I think that's what he means when he says in verse 50, his true family are those who do the will of his Father in heaven, those who have come to him and who put on his yoke, uh, who live with him as their Lord, trusting him, that's what it means to do the will of his Father and to be brought into the family of God. Well, we've covered a lot, but the key question, friends, from this passage, I think, is this. Are you with Jesus? Are you, have, you, have you come to him and put his yoke on you? Because the confronting reality from Jesus' own lips here is that whoever is not with him is, is against him. Whoever does not gather with him scatters. Because if what Jesus is saying is true, it's all true. Not just the bits that we pick and choose. Either he is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Either he's Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Either the kingdom of God has come upon you or you are still held captive to the kingdom of darkness without God and without hope in the world. So are you with him? If not, friends, let down your defences and heed Jesus' warning here. Repent and come to him. Today, there's nothing more important than that. And if you are with him, well, I, th there are hard things in this passage, but I think there is also this passage is full of sweet assurances for those who are with him. Uh, because the sign of Jonah has been fulfilled. <laughs> Through Jesus' death and resurrection, God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and he has brought us into the kingdom of his son who he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. So we don't need to fear. 
The greater Jonah has defeated the strong man and is plundering his kingdom by, by his spirit through the word of his gospel. So who is Jesus? Well, he is the king. He's the king of God's kingdom. So come to him, repent, be baptized, receive his new life, enter his family, put on his yoke and gather with him. Be on mission with him. That's I think what Jesus is getting at here. Because his plundering of Satan's house continues. It wasn't just when he was around in the flesh. It continues by his spirit through his word. It, and it's a glorious thing that you have the privilege of being a part of to gather with Jesus in his liberating work as he plunders the house of Satan through the gospel by his spirit. It's a glorious privilege we have the opportunity to be a part of. And let me pray as we finish that God will help us to see these things. Father, keep us from being merely impressed by Jesus. Certainly, Lord, we pray that you will keep us from having hard hearts to him and his word. Uh, keep us from the kind of accusations of the Pharisees or the, the not just having genuine questions, but the kind of um, hard scepticism that has already decided in our hearts who he is. Lord, give us humility before our King. Uh, keep us from relying on other things, but we, we pray, Father, that we might genuinely come to him, come to him afresh every day, come to him right now, knowing that he is gentle and humble in heart, that his yoke is easy and his burden is light, and that in him we do find rest for our souls. Lord, may many people come to him, and may you use us in this great work of plundering Satan's kingdom and saving souls. And we pray that for your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen.